Welcome to the second of two Component 1 screencasts on the news media. Now in the previous screencast we looked at the influence of the owners and advertisers on the production of the news. Uh, what we're going to move on to in the next section is to look at the role of journalists and also the organisational constraints that journalists have to work under. And as we can see through this particular image, uh, the power of media professionals, so the power of journalists, of editors, um, to refuse to cover some issues and to let other issues uh, into the news media, this particular power is called gatekeeping. So that's what this cartoon uh, is about. So events that are eventually reported uh, in the news have been through some kind of gatekeeping process with journalists and particularly news editors uh, making a decision about what is newsworthy and what is not. So journalists therefore play an important role in deciding the content of the mass media and it is they uh, who basically select what the news is and decide on its style of presentation. So in this sense, media professionals are very powerful because they're able to set the agenda for society. So agenda setting refers to uh, the influence of media professionals in laying down the list of subjects for public discussion. So obviously people within society can only discuss and form opinions uh, about things that they've been informed about and it is the mass media that provide this information in most cases. So this gives those who work in the mass media a great deal of power in society for what they choose to include or leave out of their newspapers, television programmes or websites will often influence the main topics of public discussion and public concern. And obviously this might mean that the public never discuss some subjects because they are not informed about them by media professionals. Now research carried out by Gautang and Rouge uh, showed that journalists operate with values and assumptions about which events they regard as being newsworthy. And they call these assumptions news values. So these are the assumptions, these are the values that guide journalists uh, in deciding what to report and what to leave out uh, and also how what they choose to report should be presented. And this idea of news values means that journalists tend to include and play up those elements of a story that make it more newsworthy and the stories that are more likely to be reported are those that include many newsworthy aspects. So the term news values refers to the criteria that journalists use on a day-to-day -day basis when they're uh, deciding whether or not a story is sufficiently newsworthy enough. And what we see on the next two slides are some of the main news values that journalists use in the course of their work. So stories are more likely to be covered uh, if they concern powerful individuals, organisations or institutions. So for example, uh, if the story is about a prominent politician. Uh, stories are more likely to be covered if they concern people who are famous, such as celebrities. Uh, stories are more likely to be covered if there's entertainment value uh, for the consumer. So stories concerning things like sex, show business, uh, stories that have some kind of human interest angle, for example. Uh, stories that have an element of surprise uh, or shock uh, are more likely to be covered by the news media. And stories with particularly negative overtones such as conflicts or tragedies, sort of bad news stories, are also more likely to be covered. And although bad news uh, tends to be seen as being more newsworthy than good news, uh, for balance, sometimes uh, news media will also look for stories that have particularly positive overtones, uh, such as rescues or uh, cures for illnesses. Magnitude refers to stories that are perceived as being really significant. Uh, in terms of the numbers of people involved or the potential impact. Uh, 
and this news value is sometimes also referred to as threshold. Uh, Relevance refers to stories about issues, groups and nations perceived to be relevant to the audience. We'll have a look at an example of that in a moment. Uh, Follow-up is about stories about subjects that are already in the news. So where you've got Uh, an interesting news story that has captured the public imagination, Uh, the news media will try to find new angles to keep that story going. And then finally, the newspaper agenda. Sometimes certain news organisations will find stories that represent the news organisation's own agenda. For example, the commercial media organisations will often try to find stories Uh, that attack the BBC, a public broadcaster, because it's perceived to be uh, in the interests of their news organisation to attack the BBC as a competitor. Just going back to the news value of relevance, what we can see in this particular image um, is a map showing the countries that the Guardian newspaper wrote about uh, in the year 2011. So what we can see uh, here... Uh, unsurprisingly, is that national news gets more prominence because it's perceived to be more relevant uh, to the audience than international news. And when it comes to international news, kind of powerful countries that Britain uh, has ties with, such as the USA, uh, get a lot more coverage than other countries in the world. Now, the Glasgow University Media Group, which uh, generally supports what we might call a neo-Marxist approach to the media, emphasises the importance of the assumptions of journalists informing media content and suggesting to the audience uh, interpretations of uh, particular issues. And the Glasgow University Media Group has emphasised a number of features that they think affect Uh, the content of the media. So firstly, um, they argue that journalists operate uh, within what Becker calls a hierarchy of credibility. And what this means is they treat more seriously and attach the greatest importance to the views of powerful and influential individuals and groups within society. And in doing so, um, Hall et al., suggests that such people, so the powerful, influential individuals and groups within society, uh, become the primary definers. So they become the people who regularly feature in the media and are in a position to set the news agenda and influence what journalists define as the news and how they present it. So the views of these primary definers are often presented as being kind of more reasonable Uh, to journalists and in contrast the views of the least powerful uh, individuals or groups within society are often portrayed as being kind of extreme and as not being as reasonable. So hopefully you remember this image from earlier in the video this is the rally at the end of the the biggest demonstration um, in the history of the UK Uh, the big march against the Iraq war in 2003. And there were so many people that took part in this protest that the news media, when reporting it the following day, uh, essentially had to guess at how many people uh, went on this particular march. Now, the actual organisation that put on the march, uh, the Stop the War Coalition, so the group representing the protesters, claimed that there were as many as 2 million people on the streets of London protesting against the Iraq war. However, the police claimed that the figure was half of that amount. So they claimed that there were just 1 million uh, people uh, on the streets of London. So quite a bit of difference there. But the protesters, because they have lower credibility in the eyes of most journalists compared to the police who are seen as being more trustworthy, more reliable. Um, Their particular view, the protesters' view, wasn't reflected in the news media. So the one million figure uh, from the police is what most of the newspapers reported the following day. 
is that here we've got an illustration of Becker's hierarchy of credibility. So the protesters are right down at the bottom. They're not likely to be believed as much as the police, the government and other so-called primary definers. Now, though I've really emphasised the role of media professionals in uh, selecting the news and uh, setting the news agenda, we need to remind ourselves that the news is no longer exclusively produced by professional journalists uh, working for media corporations. As we've seen in previous screencasts, and as emphasised by Paul Mason, we've now got this phenomenon of citizen journalism. So the internet wireless communication devices, such as smartphones, with cameras on them, have turned ordinary individuals into citizen journalists. And this actually gives ordinary protesters more of an opportunity to shape the news agenda and challenge the accounts of those groups that have traditionally been regarded as the primary definers. OK, let's finish this screencast by looking at some of the organisational constraints that journalists have to work under that might influence the selection and content of the news media. Now, newspapers and TV news programmes tend to work within quite tight time schedules. And this is often at most a 24 hour or shorter cycle as news is reported on a daily or more frequent basis. And increasingly with digital news programmes, you've got news bulletins all day long. So channels like Sky News and BBC News 24. And this means that shortcuts to news gathering may need to be taken and that sometimes inadequate evidence is collected to justify particular conclusions because stories aren't necessarily being checked as carefully as they should be given the time pressures that journalists are under. And these issues have been explored extensively in a recent book by The Guardian reporter Nick Davis called Flat Earth News. And in this book, Nick Davis argues that the most basic job of a journalist is to check facts. However, he argues that in practice, contemporary journalism has been corrupted by an endemic failure to verify new sources. And Davis argues that increasingly, modern day British journalism is characterised by what he calls churnalism. So this is the uncritical over-reliance by journalists on second-hand news, by the so-called facts that have been produced and fed to journalists by the government, by spin doctors, by uh, PR experts. And he notes that where once journalists were active gatherers of news, nowadays they've generally become more passive uh, processors of unchecked second-hand material much of it contrived by PR to serve some political or commercial interests. So Davis argues that they're no longer journalists, they've become journalists, and that this practice has been made worse by the fact that newspapers are seeing their circulation go down, they're trying to cut back on costs, which means that they're getting rid of journalists. So you've got fewer journalists, fewer people that have actually got the time to do proper investigative reporting or to actually check uh, the facts that they're being uh, sent from second-hand sources. And there's really good evidence to support the claims that Nick Davis is making about uh, newspapers within the UK. So in 2007, uh, Cardiff University analysed uh, the content of five daily newspapers. So the Guardian, the Times, the Independent, the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mail. So they looked at these uh, newspapers over a two week period uh, in 2007. And what they found was that 80% of the stories that they examined over this two week period consisted of material uh, that had either been given to the newspapers from the press agency or by PR companies. And only 
of the stories that they analysed were actually generated by the reporters themselves.